Hi, Mystery Knox listeners. Welcome back. It's wonderful to have you here. I'm Kim. And I'm Mary. If you're just joining us, thank you so much for listening and giving our little podcast a chance. We hope you stick around and enjoy the episode. Today we're going to talk about a little boy who vanished back in 2010 under very mysterious circumstances from his elementary school in Portland, Oregon. His disappearance prompted the largest search and rescue operation in Oregon history. Unfortunately, he's still missing. This is the case of Kyron Horman. What are you drinking? Oh, you you, know, you already said you didn't go and get coffee, right? I, you know, I just made some here at the house. I was going to. I was like, I'm going to go. Because mm-hmm. it's literally right down the road, five minutes. Um, and I'd be placing an order, so I just, you know, drive through it. But I just couldn't. <laughs> oh, gosh. I mean, we were talking about this last night, about how getting everything delivered to us has made us more lazy, I think. Well, I don't do much of the delivering i know you guys do right yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah and yeah, like I, lately especially because of covid you know yeah it's been like a lot like oh i'm hungry oh let's get this food delivered okay <laughs> yeah no the only thing like i just get coffee and i go mm-hmm. and do the drive through sort of thing i yeah yeah i don't the online order yeah that's about yeah all i do um, but yeah, I was just feeling lazy, mm-hmm. not really lazy. It's just, I had my own coffee made and, but it, yeah. in some cases, sometimes it's just like, you'd rather have someone else make it. Like I was saying. Yeah. It yeah. No, better, totally. I, I just exactly. added more sugar to this and we're good. All right. <laughs> well, I made some coffee and uh, Tyler got me this new creamer, mm. um, but it's like sugar free. But it's still good. I don't know yeah. how to explain it. No, that's exact. That's what I use. I I use uh, oh, okay. sugar free creamer. Yeah, yeah. Because so it's, it's so much sweeter. People don't realize. It kind of is. I don't have to use that much. Yeah. And it's um, what's it called? I, the flavor. I think it's caramel macchiato or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's pretty good. So before we start the story, I do. I will just say that I don't know about you, but this case was kind of hard for me Mm -hmm. just because of the subject you know his age and everything and I just couldn't help but be reminded of my own kids because I do have a seven-year-old as you know and a five-year-old so so how did you hear about this one my sister oh yeah um my sister Amber suggested this case to us and she actually used to live in Oregon and she was there when this happened because she lived around Portland like around that area. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So she wrote me, asked if we could do this case because she feels like it hasn't been getting as much um, attention. attention as it should, you know? Yeah. Cause I haven't even heard of it. Mm-hmm. I, cause when you had suggested it, I was like, okay. And then when I asked again, like, what is the significance? Um, and you went into detail about how your sister and how he, disappeared and I was like oh why Mm -hmm. isn't this out there you know it was just like one of those things where yeah it needs more light on the subject matter exactly so that is what we are doing y'all might notice my throat I don't know maybe you will or not sounds a little weird I was sick for like eight days or whatever And that's why we had to push this episode back a little bit. I could not record shit. I lost my voice. (laughs) You Um, had called. You're like, (laughs) I know. I'm like, (laughs) who is this? (laughs) They have Kim's phone, but is this Kim? (laughs) It's like, what's the secret word? I know, right? But yeah, so anyway. Shit. I'd be like, who? Okay. But yeah, so that's what happened. That's why the episode is late. And um, but yeah, with that said, let's get to the story. Kyron Richard Horman was born on September 9th, 2002 in Oregon. Kyron's birth parents were Kane Horman and Desiree Young. 
They had divorced pretty much as soon as Kyron was born and remarried. Desiree got married to Tony Young, a police detective in Medford, and Kane got married to Terry Moulton when Kyron was around two years old. Kyron was a shy child, even described as a bit awkward at times, and a kid who, quote, likes to get dirty, as his mom Desiree stated. Kyron was your typical seven-year-old child, energetic and full of life. His favorite subjects in school were science and math, and much like my own seven-year-old, he loved to describe to people everything he was learning and had a huge curiosity about things. Kyron loved to ride the bus, and he absolutely loved school. He went to Skyline Elementary School, which is nestled in between the forest and rolling hills in northwest Portland. It's a very picturesque school, where the people who lived there felt safe, and most everyone knew each other. It was a very close-knit community. Kyron ended up living with his father, Kane, and stepmother, Terry, most of the time, due to Desiree's health. She was constantly sick due to her kidney issues. Desiree stated, I had gotten to the point where I was in the hospital, usually three to four times per year. I was so sick that I was passing out at times. I was scared Kyron would hurt himself if I happened to have passed out. Desiree lived in Medford, Oregon, which was about five hours south of Portland, where Kyron lived. In addition to Kyron, he had two other siblings that lived with them, an older brother, James, Terry's son from a previous spouse that lived with them, and Kiara, Terry and Kane's daughter. It's unclear how long James lived with them, but eventually Kane ended up kicking James out for an unknown reason, and Terry was very resentful of that. On June 4, 2010, the school was getting ready for the biggest day of the year, the school's science fair. Apparently, it was a huge event at the school, and it was very busy, and I can imagine a stressful time for the staff, but fun too. All the children got to show off their science projects they had been working on, and Kyron was super excited to show off his diorama about red-eyed tree frogs, and according to his parents, he worked really hard on it. In an interview with Dateline, Kane stated, I just told him I was really proud of all the effort he put into his project. He did a really great job, and I gave him a big hug. The interviewer asked if he told him he loved him, and Kane said, I did. Desiree was planning to drive up for the science fair that day and to see Kyron, but unfortunately, she couldn't get out of work. That day, Terry brought Kyron to school. They made their way into the science fair where they set up Kyron's diorama. And just as a note, some sources say they set everything up in the gym and some say it was in Kyron's classroom. And this will be important later. Terry then took a picture of Kyron in front of it. Terry is quoted as saying, it was a normal day. There was nothing out of the ordinary. We got to school about 8.15, I believe. School didn't actually start until 10 a.m. that day, but Terry dropped him off early for the science fair. So, something to note about the science fair, it was kind of like um, when I used to have science fairs in elementary school, the gym or the classroom um, was just open. There were a lot of people there that day. People were coming in and out to look at the projects and um, it was just a lot busier than a normal school day. All the doors were open, which later on turned out, I guess they shouldn't be, but they were. So anybody, the point is anybody could just like come in and out on that day. And I don't think there was any security. No, not at the time. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, no security. Because obviously it's like until something happens, that's when they're like, oh, maybe we should have had people walking around and Maybe we should have had cameras. I'm like, dude, it's a school with kids. Mm -hmm. And there's known pedophiles, not just in the area, but in general. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing that gets me is like, this wasn't like in the 90s. This was 2010. Yeah, it wasn't that long ago. Like most schools have cameras and they have a police officer at the school. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Of course, we do talk about this later as well. And um will bring up why they said they didn't have anything, but yeah, just something to note. When on the Dr. Phil show in 2016, Terry is quoted saying, there's two levels to the school. His class is on top. And so he went up the stairs by the office. I went up the stairs that are by the gym because I've got the baby and the diaper bag. So he beat me up the stairs. And then he was going down the hallway. I stood at the top. I watched him go. I stood at the top and watched him right about as he got to his door, his classroom door. 
The last thing I remember is the back of his head. Kane worked at Intel, and that day started like every other normal day. He left for work and arrived home by 2 p.m. Kane says that Terry was there when he got home, and this will be important later. Once school started, Kyron's teacher noticed he wasn't there, so she marked him absent. Apparently, this wasn't unusual and no one from the school had called the parents regarding this matter. Kyron usually rode the bus home from school, and he was supposed to be home by 3.45 p.m. that day. But the bus came, and no Kyron. At first, Kane and Terry thought Kyron just figured his parents were going to pick him up, since Terry had dropped him off, so he wasn't worried at first. The bus driver called the school to see if Kyron was waiting for his parents, and that's when the fear set in. Kane and Terry were told Kyron hadn't been at school all day. That's when the school's secretary called 911, and a mass alert was sent to parents of the school, alerting them of a missing child. Kane and Terry drove to the school after they realized Kyron wasn't on the bus and discovered the school had Kyron's backpack and jacket. Kyron's teacher stated she didn't question his absence because she thought Terry had told her that Kyron had a doctor's appointment that day, but Terry claimed she had told them it was for the following week. It then dawned on everyone that Kyron had been missing for six hours, and no one knew. Kyron's mother, Desiree, and her husband immediately drove up to Portland once they heard Kyron was missing, which they found out by the school calling her. Desiree had called Terry to inform her, I had told her I'm coming up there, and she said, You are? And she seemed surprised at that, which I thought was strange. I said, Of course I am. I'll be there in four, four and a half hours. Once at the school, Kane contacted the police, and the search for Kyron began. Little did anyone know, this search would go on for years to come. After the break, we will dive into the investigation and the theories surrounding Kyron's disappearance. Stay with us. Hi, it's Christina and Kristen from The The Real Crime Crime Podcast. Podcast. Have you ever been curious about the real estate side of true crime? What happens to houses after someone dies in them? How dangerous is it really to be in real estate? Where did your favorite serial killer grow up? Well, Well, we we have have the the show for you. you. This is a podcast from the perspective of an active realtor and a true crime junkie. Give us a listen. You might be disappointed, but listen anyway. (laughs) All right, so here's what we know so far. Kyron was last seen at the school's science fair on June 4th, 2010. Terry, his stepmother, was the last known person to be seen with Kyron after walking him into the school to help him set up his red-eyed tree frog diorama. She even took a photo of Kyron in front of it to commemorate his special day. Now we have a photo of this on our blog, mysterynoxpodcast.wordpress.com, that if you guys wanted to check it out, it's there to look at along with other photos from the case. Mm -hmm. And the photo of his shirt is actually um, interesting because... It's a CSI shirt, like CSI crime scene shirt. So people like to point that out just because it's kind of ironic in a way, you know. And it's like a little detail, but the meaning could just, it, it, yeah, it's all over the place in what it could mean. Exactly. Like some people think it was just a coincidence, you know, that he picked that out. And then the same day he went missing, he was wearing a CSI shirt. And then, you know, other people think that... It was picked for a reason because it was easy, you know, it would be easier for him to be spotted or whatever in that shirt. Yeah, I could totally see that. But like for Mm me, um, once I learned about his stepdad being, you know, a cop, I was like, oh, that's just a nod to, you know, him just wearing that shirt. Yeah. And that could totally be another reason. too. So, I mean, me, that's that's where my mind went. But I could totally see the other reasonings as to just here, wear this so you can be spotted later on or something. Yeah, exactly. From there, Terry had said she walked him up to his class to see him off before leaving and running errands. She stopped off at a Fred Meyer to pick up a prescription for her daughter because of an ear infection, only to realize it was the wrong Fred Meyer store, it happens, and eventually went to the right one. Afterwards, she stopped off at the dry cleaners, then drove around for 90 minutes along the back roads in hopes to get her daughter to fall asleep. She also made a stop at the gym before arriving home at 12.40 p.m. But here's the thing. Teachers marked Kyron absent that day and no one had seen him in any of his classes. 
It wasn't until the arrival of the school bus at 3.45 p.m. and Kyron wasn't on the bus did alarm bells sound. At 3.46 p.m., a call was made to 911 by the school secretary, and the police arrived about 45 minutes later. Quote, Hours passed and searchers found nothing to indicate what might have happened to Kyron. The Multnomah County Sheriff's Office wasn't sure if they were dealing with an abduction or a lost child, but didn't want to take any chances. They called the FBI, and the agency immediately dispatched its child abduction rapid deployment team to assist in the search. A large-scale physical search took place on Saturday, with police and volunteers continuing to scour the dense brush around Kyron School. On Sunday, detectives started their investigation with the Skyline Elementary School community. More than 200 children and their parents were interviewed about the day Kyron went missing, but no new information was learned. End quote. So the school itself is surrounded by trees and very hilly landscapes. So if Kyron had left the school, whether on his own accord or not, it was a very real possibility no one would have seen him once he made his way into the trees, if he did. So I pulled up a photo of the school, and that can also be found on the blog. And if you look at it, literally, all that's behind the school is forest. Like, as far as I can see in the photo. And the reason I bring that up is because if he did walk out there whether by himself or with somebody, it would be super easy to lose track of somebody once they went into the forest. Like, you would not be seen. No, and it looks like there is a drop. Um, Mm -hmm. I I don't know, I'm not sure, but just the way the trees are in the shadows. Yeah, it looks like it. Like a slope down. Yeah, yeah, and that's what I was just going to say. It's a little bit, like, further down in terms Mm -hmm. of, like, it's like on, like, a little plateau, and then behind the school it goes up, is what it looks like. Like mm-hmm. a hill. That would definitely be like a struggle of some sort. That would propel me not to go. Let me just say. Like, yeah, oh, same. It's too much work. Let's try another Same. <laughs> oh, and we should also point out that Kyron couldn't really see that well. You know, even with his glasses. Yeah, I don't know if he had any sort of thing going on with his, with his eyesight. If that was um, mm-hmm. like a condition or not. It was never really said. But yeah, th- it, yeah it was known that he didn't have good eyesight. Well, then you see his glasses and, you know, on a, on a kid, it's like, oh, because they're so thick and his eyes are so big. I know. He had, like, the prettiest blue eyes. It's so cute. Between the first day Kyron went missing to the ninth, there were searches held by the community and the FBI, making it one of the largest searches in Oregon. Kyron's parents also held a press conference asking for a safe return or any information that could lead him home. A more detailed hour-by-hour timeline can be found at the link in the blog. After 10 days of massive searches for Kyron, the search shifted to a criminal investigation. Police never stated what made them change the status from missing to criminal, but it could have had something to do with Terry's suspicious behavior and failed polygraph tests. In fact, not only did Terry fail one polygraph test, but two. When she was scheduled to do a third, she walked out. She had blamed the failed test due to hearing problems for one and a rushed examiner for the other. In the fourth week of the investigation, it became clear that detectives were looking more at Terry. However, she was never named as a suspect in the case and never has been to this day. Quote, Many people seem persuaded that Terry had done something to Kyron, but detectives could not find any physical proof to support this theory. Not wanting to be blamed for tunnel vision, investigators continue pursuing other possibilities. They examined all the registered sex offenders in the area. They pulled visitor logs from Skyline Elementary School for the week Kyron went missing and searched through them. They followed up on every possible sighting of Kyron that was reported. They even got phone logs and followed up with people who had made cell phone calls routed from the tower closest to the elementary school on the morning Kyron disappeared. In the first year of the investigation, the task force questioned more than 3,500 people and spent more than 26,000 hours working on the case. Nothing brought them any closer to finding Chiron. The search was one of the largest in state history, with more than 1,300 people from Oregon, Washington, and Northern California looking for the boy. A two-mile radius around Skyline Elementary School and parts of Salvi Island, which is about six miles from the school, were also searched. End quote. There are already a couple interesting details to this already, but we have to backtrack a little bit. As more people were questioned, it was becoming clear that some details weren't adding up. After the break, we'll jump into the main theories about this case.
So the first theory that is out there in regards to the case would be that he left on his own accord which teachers don't believe because they stated that Chiron was a timid child and he wouldn't do that. He also, um, according to his mom, Desiree, she said that one of his biggest fears was being lost. And so, obviously, you would think for a seven-year-old, if that was one of your biggest fears, there's no way you would go walking by yourself in the trees. No. At all. <laughs> it's Plus, just... being seven, I don't think yeah. there's that much awareness going on. I mean, it's different with each child. I mean, I'm not saying all kids are like that, but mm -hmm. if he was very timid and he, you know, couldn't see well, like we said earlier, mm -hmm. it just it's just out of character for him to just wander. I mean, if yeah. it was in character for him to do that, they would have said that. Um, everybody was saying that, you know, everybody that knew him, the teachers and even some of the parents of the other children were saying that, you know, he was he was a great kid, but he was timid. He was shy. Um, and he just didn't like being alone, you know? He liked being around people. Mm -hmm. That whole theory about he left on his own accord and he got lost in the forest and doesn't make sense to me. No, I, I don't think so. Besides the fact that if he had, let's just say he had, okay? He walked out of the school, he went in the trees, he got lost. If that was the case, he definitely would have been found. Because when we were talking about the search... And we'll talk more about it too, but they brought, you know, they brought sniffing dogs. They had everybody out there. The police department, volunteers, the FBI, like everybody was out there. They did not wait on this case, which is a good thing. Because mm -hmm. in most of our other cases that we do, the reason that they're not solved is mainly because of crappy police work, as we've said. Mm -hmm. But this case is different. They really did go all out on trying to find Chiron. Yeah. Well, see, with that theory of him going into the forest, um, I don't, I think, I want to say I could be mistaken, but from the pictures that we've seen of that area, it, it seems mm -hmm. like there would be a drop right behind the school. Not right behind the school, because there's that hill, but then the tree line and then maybe a drop. But saying that there was a drop, who knows where he would have gone, how far mm -hmm. he would have fell or anything, because it was, right. it was pretty thick, the forest that they had there. I just think in terms of location, why would you put an elementary school next to an edge, basically? <laughs> yeah, that was one of my thoughts, too. And, you know, as we were talking about this a lot, um, I, I don't know if they had a fence around the back of the school because none of the pictures we can tell if there's actually a fence back there to cut off the children from going from. Well, the, first, they would have to walk up that big hill. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's just put that out there. Which would be difficult, but still, if they did make it up, then there's, like, nothing there to stop them from going in the trees. Yeah. Unless there's a fence that I just can't see. I want to so. say there there was. Mm -hmm. I mean, in general. You would think. Or hope so. I, I haven't seen any school out there that doesn't have a fence. That's, that's my reason. Same. I haven't either. So I'm hoping that there is, or there was, whatever. But, yeah, I don't know. But, like, from some of the photos... Um... The investigation photos that they have. There is like a chain link fence that is around at least the front of the school. I don't think there's a gate to where it would close for an entrance because I don't mm -hmm. see that. I don't see that. But yeah. I do see like a chain link fence um, next to the police car and then where they have his photo and yeah. like all the little uh, whatever that is. Hold on. I have to. So, and even like on the photo with his mom in the picture and his, um, his picture on the fence, mm -hmm. there's no gate that would close it. So that's weird. <laughs> in terms yeah, of like entrance, there's no, uh, like do not enter sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Not that we can see. But I, I want to say but... since there's a fence right here, it, it, it curves around. I mean. It should go around it the whole should? school. Yeah, yeah, it should. Um, and another thing with this whole theory about he left on his own accord is if that were true, um, the last place Terry said that she saw Chiron was he was walking into his classroom. We know that he was, well, from what she says, we know that he was in the school, in his, in the hallway, at least by his mm -hmm. classroom. So if she had actually left, like she says, and left him there, then he would have had to have 
gone all the way down the hallway, down the steps, and then like out the, out one of the exits without anybody seeing him. And then yeah, made his way out there, by himself. Wasn't there that, that span of time that she dropped him off and until he had to go to class? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's another thing. Class that day, uh, according to the sources, didn't start until 10 a.m. because of the science fair. And so she said she left at like 8.45. So that whole 9.45 to 10, what, like, what was she? Yeah, 8.45 to 10 um what was he doing like he was just gonna sit in his class i guess with with other kids that are there early or with the teacher i'm not really sure but that's another thing that would make sense for him to do mm-hmm. that if, if that's the case he would have went to class and just because he liked school he liked yeah he loved school yeah math and science and so him going to his classroom and then just hanging out with other students or the teacher because i'm pretty sure the teacher i mean that's the babysitter basically so yeah. the teacher wouldn't have no issue watching the kid. That's another thing that just doesn't make sense, is people would have seen him leaving the school. Mm-hmm. There were tons of people there that day. Tons. Yeah. You know, and it's... And, and then for no said, one to see him? I don't think so. Yeah. And then as we said before, like, this is a small-knit community. So people knew each other. You know, people knew Chiron. So... And if there was a stranger, that would be very noticeable. Like, who is this with, with Chiron? Who's who's this fool? You know, they would get very protective of him. Right. Exactly. And unfortunately, something that would have helped this case is if the school had surveillance cameras, but they didn't. They didn't have any surveillance cameras at the time. They wouldn't, though, would they? There's no security until something happens. Yeah, that seems that's how it always is. But apparently it was just very normal for this type of community not to. Because remember, it's a rural community. It's in Portland, but Mm -hmm. it's not in the city. Like, it's very rural. Well, I will say, in all the schools I've been to, we never had cameras. In, like, my elementary school in Hawaii, I don't remember cameras there. Um, Overseas was -hmm. was never a thing. Um, But the teachers... I will say they were always around. They were always watching the kids. Like uh, like before class, after class, um, there was always someone like watching out. Even here, I guess, in the high school we went to, I don't remember having any sort of surveillance there either. I don't know about the high school. I mean, I wasn't also looking for cameras either. So, I mean, they could have been there. I'm not really sure. But I know for elementary school... Maybe even middle school. I really don't know. Um, I'm pretty sure they weren't there. But again, remember the time we grew up, the years that we were going to school are way different than 2010, where most schools have already updated and have gotten surveillance cameras. Well, see, and then that's the thing. Whether you do have cameras or you don't have Uh cameras can be the same thing as either or, because there's also quality of the camera like we like where i work we have cameras but they're shit yeah that's true we can't even pull up a license plate when people drive off with gas let alone anyone in the store like to say who that person is like i don't know the face is blurry so how can i say it's this person over that person i don't know yeah and then at that point it's like why do you even have cameras (laughs) yeah and then it's like shouldn't you be getting money from i mean in terms of the school like from the state or something or even school functions like they raise money why can't some Mm -hmm. of that go towards security see that's my that's my gripe like you either have cameras or you don't but if you you have have cameras cameras, yeah have good ones they could be shit yeah the quality on them yeah because there are so many crime you know uh crime cases and stuff that i've seen where there were cameras, but it, it didn't do anything because, as you were saying, they're crap. Like, you can't tell yeah, anything Yeah, or the from placement them. on them just isn't mm-hmm. in, in the right spot to be catching anything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so that's, that's, that's my gripe is they should also invest. But a lot of places, it's just more, I guess, it's a, what is it? Just for show. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I will say, though, that since this happened with Chiron, uh, the school has installed cameras i just hope they're good cameras but it's good to have it's it's good that it's they good to have went forward and did that yeah exactly so what is our second theory we got here 
Our second theory was that he was taken from the school by a stranger. Which I don't believe. What do you think? I think it's more possible... This this theory is more possible than the one of him just, you know, wandering off by himself. But still, I'm not... I'm just not sure about it. Because of the third theory, which we will talk about in a little bit. But, um... Possible, yes. The school was open that day because of the science fair. You know, people were coming in and out all day. There wasn't probably as much, or if any, security that we know of, you know, that hasn't really been stated. You know, it is Portland, so it's still a city, even though it was in a rural area. There are still a lot of registered sex offenders around that area. So could someone have come in unnoticed and taken him? Yes. Is it Mm -hmm. likely? I don't think so. Just because people knew Kyron, you know, just because of how close everybody was. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I could see it being more likely than the first theory, but I don't, I don't think it was this. No, I don't, I don't think so either. Um, Just because of the fact that everyone knew each other. I mean, sure it was open, but I can't say I, I go with this one. And here's another thing about this case that bugs us, and I'm sure a lot of people that have researched it. A lot of the stuff that we know, we can't really confirm just because the police and even Terry and um, Desiree and Kane, Kyron's parents, are not confirming stuff. They're still holding stuff back. That's what I don't get. Yeah, there's still a lot of stuff that they won't let out to the public. So a lot of this stuff is just Desiree said this, Kane said that this is what happened, Terry said this is what happened. I mean, we do have obviously some stuff like we have witnesses and stuff confirming things, but like a lot of it is just very frustrating because we can't be like, yes, she said this and we looked it up and it's true. You know, there's physical evidence of it. Like I can understand um, the privacy aspect to it all. But if this mm-hmm. is an investigation and you're asking the public for help, mm-hmm. and I, I get there is a lot of information already out there, but some like little details could mean a lot. Yeah, exactly. Like the truck across the street at the gas station. Right. And that was it. Like, yeah, are we not it- finding out more information? Are we not checking the gas station um, surveillance, if they have it, <laughs> um, of this truck? But no, we we don't know. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know if the police actually checked it out and if they did check and if and if it was true. We don't know. We just have what Terry says. But we have a good timeline. Yeah. But even the detail on that timeline is lacking. Mm -hmm. And that's what I found so frustrating. Like, yeah, this is very informative. This hour, that hour, this day, two days later. But it's still like... It's still missing information. I still need a little bit more than that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And exactly. it wasn't providing it. Yeah. But this third theory, I think we mm-hmm. both agree on, just just yes. because of, of details, um, was that he was taken by someone he knew or trusted. Mm-hmm. And I think we're both leaning on the stepmom, Terry. Yeah, on Terry. Yeah. Yeah. According to Terry... She had said that she got to the school around 8.15 a.m. to help Kyron set up his science project and then walked Kyron to his class. The last of Kyron that she saw was the back of his head. She doesn't say anything more or less, though. Now, did she actually see him walk into class or just in the direction of his classroom? In this scenario, every detail counts. And there is a difference, walking in the direction versus walking into his classroom. There were several witnesses, a friend of Kyron and two other adults that mentioned they saw Terry leave through the side entrance of the school with Kyron and his little sister before getting into a white truck around 8.45 a.m. Okay, but before we go any further, let's talk about where the science fair was held because from looking at the picture of Kyron, it was in a classroom and not in an auditorium, which I'm a little confused about what Terry was talking about when she said when she walked him to his classroom. Yeah, it's important because of the statement Terry made about the last time she saw Kyron. And I know um, on the blog again, we do have a picture. It's I don't think it's a very good picture because if it's two floors, it's really only showing one. But mm-hmm. I guess it's the same thing from top to bottom. Yeah, it'll show the second floor hallway, the classrooms, um, all the staircases that lead up there. And it shows the gym area. But the reason why this little 
detail is so important is because Terry stated to many people that she never actually went in Kyron's classroom. She said she never go took him in the classroom. Her statement is she was in the hallway watching him walk to his classroom. And she never actually saw him go in before she left. However, if you look at the picture of Kyron that she took in front of his project, it looks like it's in his classroom. Yeah, that's what I was confused about. Like, for the longest time, I thought it was in, in the gym, the auditorium, wherever they want to mm -hmm. call it. But I looked at this, and it only showed, like, half, not half the picture, but it showed, or it cut off a little bit above his head. And yeah. then I was like, there has to there has to be more. There has to be another kind of picture. And then there was. I found that diorama picture and then him, mm -hmm. a more fuller picture, where it shows it's in a classroom. Right. And even Desiree, um, Kyron's mom, she was saying on the Dr. Phil show, like, I don't understand why she's saying she, she didn't go in his classroom because she she took the picture. People saw her take the picture of him. And so obviously she was in the classroom. So why would you lie about that? That just doesn't make sense to me. I, w I would kind of, not to go off subject, but I kind of want to know what the kid next to him was doing his project on, because I just see stovetop stuffing. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> God. I saw that, too. It's like, oh, the red-eyed <clears throat> tree frog. What is this? Off to the right? <laughs> stovetop. Stovetop. Now I want some. But anyway. I was, I was trying to think of reasons, like, why she would have to lie about not taking him in the classroom. And... In looking at that floor plan, that is a long hallway. Mm-hmm. And then she said they went up two different staircases, right? I think um, Terry said that she went up the main... So where the where it shows main the main entrance hallway, yeah. Terry said that's where she was standing in the hallway. Like kind of... <clears throat> not. I don't think it's quite in the middle, but kind of a little ways down. And then Kyron's classroom is the very one on the end. She said, he went up the stairs by the office, and I went up the stairs that are by the gym. He beat me up the stairs, and then he was going down the hallway. I stood at the top, I watched him go. But why would you, why would you do that? Like, why would you separate? Her, Her excuse is that she had, yeah, the baby in the diaper bag, so. I don't really know why that would make you go in a different hallway, but... I'm not. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. It does. A lot of stuff she says does not make sense. I'm just going to unless that she out there. placed saying she had carried everything in um, mm -hmm. unless she placed all those items near that exit, because if you're coming in that way, but I still don't get. OK, you run ahead and I'll just sit here and watch you go. Right. And I think we talked about this before. It's I think it's because people get uh, complacent when they're at like a school you know with their children they're like oh school's safe or it should yeah. be safe at least you know what i mean mm -hmm. so they're not so much like you have to stand right near me you know mm -hmm. um that is true because it's mm -hmm. yeah but yeah it's saying if that's where the parking is and she said you may have brought her stuff in and left it there and just walked around then okay mm -hmm. but that still doesn't make sense the fact that where she took her pictures was in a classroom right and that never really got resolved from the information that i could find like desiree brings it up and people are just like oh yeah that that's weird but then it like it's like it's glazed it's, over yeah you know but yeah, but yeah it's just so. that that was like one of the main things of you say it was held in a gym but it's it, the setup is in a classroom Mm -hmm. That's what got me. I am confused about that. Yeah. Unless they brought it into the gym for a bit and then moved it. I don't know, but I don't think so. I don't think that happened. I don't think Cause so. Because that would have been mentioned by the teachers. Like, oh yeah, it was brought in and then it was moved. Yeah. So after Terry left, she ran errands from 9 a.m. to 12.40 p.m., which is interesting. Mm-hmm. Because of the 90-minute drive around. Exactly. Her going to a different Fred Meyer store for meds by accident, I can see that. Dry cleaners, mm -hmm. okay, but driving around back roads aimlessly for 90 minutes is suspect. Because from what you were saying, Kim, if your child isn't falling asleep within 30 minutes, it's it's not going to happen. 
Yeah, usually. I mean, because I remember when the girls were babies, and I did do this sometimes. I would drive around trying to get them to fall asleep for their nap or, or even bedtime sometimes. Because um, sometimes it does put them to sleep, you know, the driving. Mm -hmm. But 30 minutes, okay. You know, maybe even 45, I'll give you that. But 90 minutes, that's... no. And this is something that Terry can't even account for other than that's what she was doing. But 90 minutes, though? There also may have been a phone call made around 1040, but it's unconfirmed. However, her cell phone did ping in the general area of Salvi Island. To further elaborate on that, a search was conducted at Salvi Island, but the search came up empty-handed. Even though the towers pinged Terry's phone in that area, video cameras would suggest otherwise. There was only one way in and one way out, and she was not on that footage. By the way, this is also something she denies, that she was near Save Island and that her phone pinged. Of course. Of course she would. And this wouldn't be the last of it either. By 11.40, she went to the gym and was home by 12.40. Another thing. If your child was sick, would you drag your child to the gym? I, I don't think you would, but that's exactly what Terry did. Absolutely not. No. I mean, just think of all the germs. Mm-hmm. Besides, gyms and any daycare and stuff like that, they usually have um, strict policies about that. They don't want sick kids. Yeah. You know, because you're going to get everybody else sick. Also, are we taking into consideration travel time? Because if that's the case, she didn't spend much time at the gym. Now, I know we don't know exactly how long it takes her to get from the gym to her house, but this just comes off as sketchy. Mm-hmm. Wait a second. I completely donut glazed over this. It just occurred to me. Was she picking up or dropping off clothes at the dry cleaners? It doesn't say if she was picking up or dropping off. So that, you would think that that would be a huge clue. Yeah. Like, like that could have been bloody clothes or something. Like, oh, I just cut mm -hmm. my finger and it's like spots on a shirt. <clears throat> Not, like, exactly. I don't, I didn't find anything about that. It was just, she went to Fred Meyer. She went to mm -hmm. the, dry the dry cleaners and then to the gym. That is so... That's, that's, yeah, dry cleaner. Suspicious. No follow-up on it that we could find. And and that kind of went, like, under the radar until, like, this moment where I'm like, dude, dry cleaners. And again, we don't know if, I mean, I am hoping that the police checked all this stuff out that we don't know about. You know, I'm hoping that they actually did. Yeah, because they kept because, a lot of things under wraps. A lot of things. Yeah. They, there's still, like Mary said, tons of stuff that... They're holding back, which I'm sure they're doing it for a reason, but mm -hmm. for people that are, you know, researching the case, it can I'm be quite frustrating. You. Yes. Yeah. And then it just comes off like, oh, so you didn't do your research. Well, mm -hmm. yes and no, because you could only do so much because that's mm -hmm. all they're willing to allow, which I get. I, I do. But mm -hmm. again, we're trying to help you. There were many more instances that happened which didn't lend a favorable light on Terry. So the first kind of odd thing that she did is four days after Kyron disappears, Terry posts a Facebook status about, quote, hitting the gym tonight, end quote. And Dr. Phil actually brought this up when Terry was on um, his show. And he was like, basically making a point about how Terry... You know, she makes this big show about how she feels Kyron is her own son. She loves him like her own. And um, he was basically saying four days after Kyron's gone, like, would you post this if it was your own child hitting the gym tonight? Like, that makes that makes no sense. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to the gym, you're going to the gym. You don't need to make a spectacle about it. Exactly. And then she was just... Was she an avid Facebook user? Is that... I mean, or did it just... She just posts every now and again. If you know. If you know. Yeah, that I don't know. Okay. But I will just say, if my child went missing, God forbid, the last thing I'm thinking about is the gym. Or even Facebook posting about hitting the gym. That would be the absolute last thing on my mind. And it's only been four days. Yeah. 
And so that was just brought up as like a kind of red flag thing. Like, okay, this is just a little strange. So another odd thing that happened in the case is two weeks after Kyron disappeared, Kane moved out of the house that he shared with Terry and he took their one-year-old daughter with him. Um, He would eventually file for divorce on June 28th. And the reason being that he moved out is around this time frame, it came out that Terry was in a, quote, murder for hire plot Mm -hmm. and had asked the landscaper to get rid of her husband for 10K. So Terry said her husband was mean to her. She was in an abusive relationship, which led to making that decision. Of course, and we have to say, you know, she does deny this, obviously. Of course you would. <laughs> of course yeah, you would. Yeah, who's, who's going to be like, oh yeah, I, I tried to murder my husband. Um, but. So of course she denies this. Yes, but in 1990, she did something similar, right, to someone she was seeing? Apparently, yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, obviously that never happened. Um, the guy jumped on the bushes and she yelled, he's coming for you. And then that was it. That was the most of it. But I was like, mm-hmm. if that's in your history of things you do, yeah, this is something, uh, it's hard to r- rule out. Exactly. So she completely denies this. But again, it's like, why would some random, la- random landscaper who worked for you a few times doing your yard make this up? Mm-hmm. Why? Like, what is the reason? And he didn't, he didn't go to the police at first. It was like, what, three weeks after? Yeah, it was a couple weeks after yeah. Kyron then, went missing. And then they were also saying that, well, the landscaper doesn't really know much English. Mm-hmm. And I was like, uh, that can go like two different ways. Either he misunderstood or mm-hmm. he knew enough to be like 10K for murder, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's another just kind of obviously, that's a huge red flag. I mean, the police are the one who are the ones who told Kane about it and at first he didn't believe it mm-hmm. and so he's like you know there's no way like who would believe that their spouse is trying to get them murdered you know what I mean apparently and of course we don't have this uh the police possibly showed him evidence I'm not really sure how they would or you know what was shown to him or said to him to get him to actually take it seriously because he did eventually and then he moved out that's when he moved out and took their daughter I don't know if she fought for the daughter it just comes off like, you're not taking her. We're going. You know? Mm-hmm. And if you were a parent, if you loved your child, you would put up more of a fuss. But the fact that she didn't... Yeah. Or maybe they, that's just something they didn't disclose. But I, I'm just like, why wouldn't you? Yeah. It's, it's very interesting. interesting. Another thing that got brought up with Terry is three weeks after Kyron disappears she starts sexting with one of Kane's friends. Now, apparently these were very graphic. We're not going to read them here. No, it, it was, it was, yeah, graphic, but it was awkward. <laughs> it was so yeah. awkward. Um, <laughs> and then you said, I mean, I came across it on my own and then you had to listen to Dr. Phil saying this. So that's even more. I cringe. did. But yeah, same effect it it's it's like ew Uh very awkward and and that's putting it lightly it's one of the things i could yeah could not she also um, sent photos which i'm glad i didn't come across oh yeah of course (laughs) i don't know if you did i don't know if you did (laughs) no i did not no thank goodness (laughs) What, what we kind of do, folks, is we do our own research and then, like, compare notes. So this is, uh... Yeah. Um, even if you had come across it, I'd be like, pass. <laughs> That's gonna be a hard pass. Oh, God. My eyes. But, you know, this is just another red flag. It's been three weeks. And, again, Dr. Phil brings this up. If you really think of Kyron as your own biological child, basically, is mm-hmm. what she wants everybody to believe three weeks and he even says he's like you don't know where Chiron is presumably yeah. you know you don't know if he's alive if he's hungry if he's being hurt he even said you don't know if he's being raped like you don't know any of this yeah. but here you are sexting with one of your husband's friends and she and her excuse because again she 
either she has an excuse for for anything or she denies all of this stuff. Um, her excuse was, well, Kane is doing the same thing. So I this is all a revenge thing. Three yeah. weeks after your child goes missing? Come on. Chick. And yeah, and, and that there's no point in it that I've come across that it would show that she actually cares for Kyron. Mm-hmm. There was, like, even watching interviews, it was just a blank stare. And when she would give her answers, it, it was very monotone. It wasn't, there was no emotion. Yeah, I was just going to say, she comes across very emotionless in a lo- in basically all of her interviews. Even when they do the, um, like, in the first week of his disappearance, if you guys go on and, and look for this on YouTube, you can look at the... Um, conference that they did the news conference in like the first week that Kyron went and disappeared and just look at her body language Mm -hmm. it's very very strange when she hugs Desiree right Mm mm-hmm yeah oh it's it's uh it's uncomfortable and even the look on Desiree's face is like oh she's touching me Mm -hmm. (laughs) but she she even yeah yeah and she tenses up too yeah and that's you know that's that's not genuine is what I'm saying The other thing, or I guess another thing I should say (laughs) with Terry, is we kind of already touched on this, how she failed the two lie detector tests. She blamed blamed it on a hearing problem for the first one. Uh And then the second one, she said that the examiner was rushed. And then on the third one, she didn't even take it. She walked out. Mm -hmm. Desiree believes that Terry didn't hear due to the fact that she went through the same testing. So Desiree had said that prior to the testing... They go over the test with you on whether or not you can hear them, if you need food or water, and they make sure you're comfortable, which makes sense as they need some sort of baseline to work off with. Mm -hmm. And um, so Desiree doesn't believe her. No. Actually, I think quite a lot of people don't believe her. But this is another thing that Dr. Phil brought up. He was like, well, if you couldn't hear, this should have all been taken care of before the testing began. Yeah. And Terry stated that she did tell them, um, but that the person uh doing the test basically just told her to scoot her chair over so that she could better hear out of her right ear and also she was annoyed because the examiner sat like to her side and behind her but that's where they always sit and we should also make note about polygraphs in general i mean that's not something Mm -hmm. you can count on but yes the fact that she failed at least two of them Mm-hmm. And that's wouldn't probably, even take the third one. Yeah, and that's probably why they we, they did a second one. It was maybe she was flustered. They they were just trying to work with her, but right. But she failed that one too. Yeah. And like you said, I have a whole kind of thing with polygraphs because I'm not like a huge fan of them, just because they are. Well, first they're not even admissible in court, so part of me is like, why even have them in a way? But the other part is they can be really unreliable. I think depending on. Who's, who's giving the test. Yeah. Um, and then it just depends on the person taking it as well. So that being said, that's out there. You know, she failed two. She walked out of the third one. So it just doesn't look good. Mm-hmm. And since we're on the topic of polygraphs, Dee Dee, who's a friend of Terry's, had to take the polygraph test because someone had said that they may have may had seen her in Terry's truck on the day of Kyron's disappearance. Terry, of course, has always refused this, and Dee Dee told police that she was at work that day, the day that Kyron went missing. Dee Dee would later pass the polygraph and always maintain that she had nothing to do with this disappearance. However, yes. Yeah, you tell them. (laughs) However, this chick, okay. While doing gardening work in Portland, she got a call and left abruptly, leaving her place of work for an hour and 30 minutes. Hmm. Now, if that wasn't sus as you say <laughs> mm-hmm. sus yes if that wasn't uh questionable i i don't know what what is and she never said she just left they got to go and she was back by by 1 p.m. to do the rest of her her job mhm and so she never stated where she was what she was doing yeah it's right? basically okay. none of your business i'm back ah interesting yeah. because as people should remember who else was kind of gone for an hour and 30 minutes. Terry. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Apparently driving around on back roads trying to get her daughter to sleep. 
So that's very interesting to me. Mm-hmm. Like, they're really good friends. She suddenly gets a call and is gone for that exact amount of time that Terry was driving mm-hmm. around with her yeah. child on the back roads. Interesting. So according to many sources and evidence, such as emails, etc., Terry apparently did not like Kyron, even though she completely denies this. Um, Some emails were sent about her resentment of Kyron and how she, quote, wanted him out of the house, and also how she hates Kyron and wishing he would just die. She even tried to send him back to Desiree to live with her, but Kane you know, Kane wasn't having it. He didn't want Kyron to go back and live with Desiree. Um, But apparently Terry did try to send him back. Terry was angry. We previously said that, you know, Kane had kicked out her older son, James, and she was angry about that. Um, And if the rumors are true about the murder for hire, she literally tried to have Kane murdered. So this kind of whole brought up a whole nother thought in my head about her trying to have Kane murdered. Since he wasn't murdered, obviously, my thought was that if she did do this, it was like, oh, well, crap, I kind of, I couldn't get rid of Kane, so maybe it'll be easier if I just get rid of Kyron. And that would be the biggest hit towards him. Mm-hmm, towards because, the parents. Yeah. yeah. Well, both of them, yeah, but, like, that would hit him where it hurts. Exactly. Another thing, and again, we can't verify this because, as we've said, the police are just not putting stuff out there. But apparently Terry's cell phone records didn't match up with the times that she told police on where she was the day Kyron disappeared, which is really interesting. And Desiree said this on Dr. Phil as well. They kind of talked about this a little bit. And then there's also a book called Boy Missing by Rebecca Morris and... I found this really interesting because it raised questions about an unexplained injury on Terry Horman's leg, which was the day that Kyron went missing. And apparently it was a good sized gash just below her knee. When questioned about this, Horman actually said that she dropped a weight on her leg at the gym. No. Which doesn't make sense. I could see it being a bruise, not so much as like a gash. Are we talking blood? Is that what that Yes. Was? Okay. Yes. And just to put this out there again, Terry denies most of what we've covered here. And when she isn't denying something, she has excuses for her behavior. So like I said about the Facebook post, she states the police told her to keep acting like everything was normal. When she was asked about the sexting, she states Kane was also sexting. So this was for revenge. So stuff like that, she denies. Here's Terry's statement. I did not kill him. I did not kidnap him, and I just want him found. Fact is, I don't know where he is. I don't know who has him. I do not know if he's alive, if he's being held captive, Terry told Dr. Phil. We should also reiterate that Terry has never been labeled a suspect and hasn't been to this day by the police. We're also not saying it's her. However, there's just a lot of circumstantial evidence that points towards her. I just don't get why she doesn't do anything that goes against it. Like, you did it, and she's just like, eh, whatever. Instead of like, no, it it wasn't me. Like, she wasn't standing up for herself. But again, if that's like a legal thing that, you know, they do as to not say anything, however... Well, she has an excuse for that. She, again, she says that her lawyers told her not to say anything. And her lawyer is the one that was like, she's suspect number one. Mm-hmm. Like, it wasn't the cops. It was her lawyer that was like, she's sketch. She's it. Yeah. She's the one. Um, so that, I found, was kind of interesting. I mean, you pay a person to back you in court, and they're saying, no, it is you. <laughs> <laughs> if that's not telling, yeah, I don't know what is. No, but I, I do just want to say, when I started researching this case, you know, obviously there are so many videos and stuff out there that just point towards Terry and they automatically go and attack Terry and I was trying for this episode to like and even during the research to just not go that way I was trying to keep an open mind basically yeah about no, same, because, other things could have happened to because him. you don't just want to focus on one when there could be like another person right there point blank like exactly 
However, it's hard to do when all of this stuff keeps coming up about Terry, you know, mm-hmm. and obviously you are free to make up your own mind and do your own research about it if you... And we encourage that too, like, like hear the story, know what's going on, but also do your own research, uh, formulate your own idea. Um, yeah. But when it comes down to it, it is, it is Chiron we're trying to get back. We're trying yes, to help. Exactly. Exactly. And that, you know, we don't want to lose sight of that. Chiron. And, yeah. And like I was saying too, like early on, I knew nothing about this. Kim mm-hmm. did. So one more person to know one more thing that may help in, in getting him back or at least yeah. information on him. Exactly. I mean, the more people know about this case, the better, you know, the more that people hear his story, the better, the more it's shared, the better. And I do just want to say real quick, if you are in the Portland area, like if you live there, you know, just be aware because, you know, if you like to go on hikes or just in, you know, foresty areas, any area that's kind of out there, just be aware of your surroundings. You'll never know you know, you might come across some evidence. You might come across a shirt. You might come across glasses or shoes. And instead of just being like, oh, it's trash, you know, maybe just get involved, you know, call the police about it because it could be something. Yeah. I mean, if it, even if it's nothing, they, they will. Mm-hmm. Take They'll it rule into it consideration. out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because it's still an open case, right? Yes, it's still an open case. Um, he's still missing, so it's still an open case. So please just everyone be aware and let's get the word out for Kyron. Since the day Kyron went missing on June 4th, 2010, there have been numerous searches done at the school, at Kane's house, and the area surrounding those places. But despite all efforts, no trace of Kyron has ever been found, but the case is still active today and searches are still being held. Kyron Horman has brown hair, blue eyes, he's a Caucasian male, and at the time of his disappearance, he weighed 50 pounds, and he was 3 foot 8 inches tall. He also wore metal framed glasses. He was last seen wearing a black t-shirt with the letter CSI in green and a handprint graphic on it, black cargo pants, white socks, and black Skechers sneakers with orange trim. We don't know what happened to Chiron, and unfortunately the sad reality is that we might never know, especially if no physical evidence is ever found, or if no one speaks up. Someone out there knows something. Speak up. It's been 11 years since Chiron disappeared from Skyline Elementary School, but his parents Desiree and Kane will never give up hope, and they will never stop looking for their son. Desiree wrote this message to Chiron from her Facebook wall on June 4th, 2021. It says, As today rises, I can't help but feel our search for Chiron will shift as we turn over 11 years since he has been missing. Things are too quiet, and it sounds like Multnomah County may not even know that they are still searching for Chiron. This is not acceptable, and I will be taking it to their doorstep. Maybe we all need to ask why haven't we been searching? Why haven't we got a Chiron task force yet? And most of all, why haven't we charged Terry? Mr. DA and Mr. Sheriff, hello. We're done waiting. It's been 11 years. Kyron, I love you and I will never stop fighting for you. There is a $50,000 reward for information leading to the resolution of Kyron's disappearance. If you have any information on Kyron Horman's disappearance, please contact the Kyron tip line at 503-261-2847. You can also go to the website www.bringchironhome.org. If you would like to print out Chiron's missing persons flyer from the FBI, we will have that link on our blog as well. All of Chiron's photos that we've talked about um, and all of the information we just went over can be found on our blog, and the photos will also be on our Instagram highlights under cases. So make sure you go and check those out. All right, Mystery Knox listeners, that's it for today's case. Thank you so much for joining us. We want to hear your thoughts on this episode, so let us know on our Instagram and Facebook at Mystery Knox Podcast, on Twitter at Mystery Knox Pod, or send us a voice message on anchor.fm slash Mystery Knox Podcast. 
A list of our sources and photos from this case can be found on our blog at mysterynoxpodcast.wordpress.com. If you'd like to help support this podcast, you can give us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts, and don't forget to subscribe to us on Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google, or wherever you listen to your podcast. We'll see you on our next episode, and remember, stay weird, stay curious. Hi, Mystery Knox listeners. <laughs> I am trying to talk here. I know, here. sorry. Oh, I'm bad timing. Oh. <laughs> bad timing, you say? Yes. With a smirk. You did that on purpose. I did. I knew it. Alright, I'm good. I'm chip free. Okay. <laughs> Alright. <sighs> Three, two, one. <laughs> I'm sorry, was that bugging you? <laughs>